welcome to this carrier check-in as part of Breakbulk Europe Connect 21. We're delighted to have you all here joining us virtually today and really hope that you've been enjoying the sessions if you've managed to tune in this morning. Before I hand over to our fantastic speakers, I would just first like to thank our sponsors for this session, Bilbao Port and Uniport Bilbao, and we'll now play a short video from them. Bilbao Port has a favourable geographical location, but it also offers modern and functional facilities with a wide range of sea services. The expansion of its facilities has given new traffic connections and operations a boost, providing services to developing industrial clusters such as those related to energy. In this context, the rapid rise of wind power has made Bilbao Port the centre for manufacture, logistics and exports of components of wind systems and for projects linked to gas and oil. Thus, Bilbao Port has become the new leader when it comes to heavy shipping operations, offering a high level of specialization with its 5,000 operations per year. Bilbao Port sails alongside several companies that are world references in this sector, thus offering a competitive advantage within an agile and flexible enclave. The increased size of the parts makes transportation and logistics more complex. The Port Authority of Bilbao promotes the coordination among the institutions and agents involved in the transportation of these parts from factories to the port in order to ensure the competitiveness of their clients. The Port Authority of Bilbao works to be a dynamic and efficient hub in order to guarantee the future of a strategic sector of our economy. So many thanks again to our sponsors for today's carrier check-in. Before we get started, I'd just like to quickly go over a couple of housekeeping points for this session. So firstly, this webinar will be available on demand after the session, so no panic if you miss anything, you'll be able to access the content at a later date. And we will be hosting a live Q&A with our panellists after the discussion. So if you have any questions, please could you ask them in the Q&A tab on your right-hand side, and we'll do our best to get to them at the end of the session. So I'd now like to hand over to Carly Fields, who is the news editor here at Breakbulk Events and Media, and will be moderating this carrier check-in. Over to you, Carly. Thank you, Liz, uh, for that lovely introduction. So I'll just introduce our panel first off. We've got a great panel here. So we have uh, Sarah Schlotter, the uh, Senior Director Niche Products at Hapag Lloyd. We have Oscar Ostadius, our Chief Sales Officer at Hoag Autoliners, Ben Collins, our Global Project Cargo Manager at MSC, and Laurence Gauvert, Director of Chartering and Projects at Jumbo SAL Cell Alliance, which is obviously a newly created one, so I'm excited to have you here to talk about that as well. We'll kick off, I think, with um, today. Let's look at today first before we start looking at uh, the future things. We have a historically um, great freight market, which I'm sure you are all enjoying. Um, so I wanted to ask, first of all, what are the upsides and the downsides of this spike? Um, it is largely unanticipated. We all hoped for it to return like this, but it's the, the way it's gone has just been beyond expectations. So um, who would like to kick off with that question? All right, then uh, I'm just going to get to that. I'm so sorry. Ladies first, I guess. Yes, thank uh, you, Sarah. So thank you, Carly, for the question. So I think, I mean, Hapag Lloyd being a container carrier obviously has very uh, different challenges, right, than some of the uh, the break bar carriers as an example. But but I think it's, yeah, I mean, freight rates, they're fantastic, right? I mean, shipping lines in general are doing well, but the, the lack of space and that internal, let's say, fighting over the space, um, and, you know, if it's not dry cargo, if it is uh, special cargo, if it is also not break bar, I think that is actually... Um, overall, right now, the biggest challenge, how to prioritize actually overall your book of business, but at the same time, trying to make sure, of course, that you deliver a high quality service towards your customers and also deliver on what has been promised in the past. 
I think by now it is kind of like the new normal, right? We've all been now operating in this already for, for quite a number of months. And I guess the customers to some extent have also gotten used to it for good and bad, I guess. Um, but I think the, the negative part is to, just that it's not easy to deliver necessarily right now because of that internal battle more or less going on. But at the same time, of course, it is still a strong market all around. And that obviously is uh, is a, something good also for us. Yeah. And, and Ben, are you seeing the same thing, obviously, coming from the shipping um, container shipping line side? Yeah, I think, you know, really just reflecting a little bit what Sarah said there, you know, the market is incredibly strong at the moment. You know, we had the pandemic first, then the Suez on top of it, just add a little bit more pressure into the market and added some more challenges. To be frank with you, I think like the rest of us, it's a difficult time for everybody in the supply chain at the moment, carriers included, you know, and, and, and the sooner we can get to some normalised operations across the world, I think the better for everybody in reality. And uh, Laurence, I mean, you're looking more at the, the, the heavy lift side with the, I think with the offshore side, that's really helped um, with you guys. So are you finding the same same issue that you've got this um, fight to be able to fill your ships? You've got you've got too much cargo, essentially too much demand. Yeah, at the moment we we definitely see that eh? it, it it started off with the with the containers and uh, containers taking breakable cargo. They're probably now saying more no to breakable cargos uh, as they need the spaces for containers, and that puts an, a pressure on the multi-purpose uh, market. But in 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 general, yeah, I mean we are not uh, fed up with enjoying the wave. Uh, we are still uh, recovering, so to say. Um, but indeed, it is a, a very tight balance between being able to deliver uh, because in our industry, the market is just starting to adapt to come earlier to the market mm -hmm. in order to guarantee that they have sufficient uh, or the required uh, available tonnage. Yeah. Uh, and Oscar, obviously, uh, again, another different cargo type that you're, you're looking at. So how are you finding this market? Yeah, I, th I think uh, I agree with, with everyone. I mean, our vessels also trade in the line of service, and so we are experiencing, of course, the same same challenges uh, container carriers are, are experiencing. But uh, it's also very interesting, as Lawrence is uh, into. We always see cargo uh, floating between rural segment or container industry or the break bulk carriers, and of course. When you see such tight market, you see a further recalibration as well. More cargo, new customers coming into also our sector. But it's all, of course demanding. Uh, we have contract customers. We should fulfill commitments, etc. And, and at the same time, you want to attract new customers and new cargo so they can experience uh, also shipping break bulk and product cargo on, on rural vessels. Well, it's a, it's a great place to be, so I don't think any of us are going to uh, complain. Um, but but how are we looking for the rest of this year and into 2022? Uh, is it is this market going to continue? Are we going to continue to have these these lovely freight rates and great demand for our services? Um, perhaps, Oscar, I'll come to you first, as you've just finished with the, with the first question. I mean, we, what we see in the market right now, and we see continuously a lot of disruptions. Uh, of course, we are loading a lot of cars on our vessels as well, and we see huge uh, disruptions on semiconductors and volume fluctuations. Uh, we see slightly now softer, uh, temporarily softer uh, market right now, but it's expected to recover and stay quite strong, uh, but it's difficult to predict the market as well uh, these days. If you ask me how the market looked 12 months from now, it's it's really challenging. But uh, yeah, it looks, looks tight. Uh, does anyone else agree with that comment? Yeah? Yeah, I, I would I would agree uh, in in full. Uh, <clears throat> I think if you look at uh, at a break bulk uh, market, um, at least seven or eight months, I I would uh, say that we are still confident. Um, looks like now huh, we have suffered a perfect storm on the negative side, and now it looks like the, the perfect storm is uh, is is coming in a positive side. I also want to highlight that that of course carriers are enjoying it at the moment, but I think also the industry, the EPCs, the clients, they know that the previous situation was not sustainable. Uh, so I think the market is is all well, and they they predicted it maybe one or two years ago that what what was going on with the severe competition and everything, that that was not sustainable. And if you then run the risk that at the end of the day, there's maybe three or four players left over, 
because the rest is all disappeared or did something else or whatever, yeah, then that's also not uh, a bright outlook. So I think the market uh, is considering this, well, maybe not the new normal, uh, but um, yeah, they, they have to accept uh, that this is the current state of play. And it would be interesting to see what the global shift in that relates uh, or in that relation brings uh, with it. Uh, because now we have seen that certain cargo volumes are shipped at freight rates that are exceeding the cargo value. That is something I've heard repeatedly and, and quite unbelievable, really. Um, is that something that you're seeing on the container side, Sarah? Um, yeah, I mean, for some commodities, that would definitely be the case uh, because you, I mean, on the dry segment, I mean, it doesn't really matter which trade you're talking about, right? All of them have taken some massive, massive increases and are still taking also continuously increases. So for uh, for some of the commodities, especially on the you know more traditional backhaul trades, they're definitely getting to a point where it is uh, breaking even, where it's maybe not worthwhile anymore, you know, to ship something from Europe to to China as an example, right? So um, so I think um, that will and also now, I mean. Looking at the ever given, I think that will definitely also have an impact continuously on, on people looking at their, their supply chains and then maybe moving more again towards a trend of near sourcing. So that could very well be, be the case. Actually, that's the uh, question I was going to move on to, the, the near shoring side. Are, are we actually starting to see a real move towards that? We've talked about it um, uh, many times that you know we're going to be moving more towards localization. Um, are we actually really seeing that now? Um, Laurence, I know this is a subject quite close to your heart. Well, <clears throat> I think we do. Uh, but also, if you look at it on a, on a more consumer uh, scale, uh, we see that in Europe, people, the, the, the COVID pandemic has also shown the dependency on uh, China as fabricator of mouth masks, uh, of respiratory material. Um, so there, uh, let, 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 let's not forget the, the computer chips. At the moment, you cannot find a computer chip. So there you see that a lot of industries are affected by really tiny things. And I I think the EU announced uh, last week that they want to improve their fabrication of EU chips up to 22 or 24% because now it's only 8% of the world uh, production. So yeah, you will probably see that that the, the, the more domestic, the more controlled uh, production uh, from a strategic point of view, but maybe also even from a, uh, a cost point of view. And is, is nearshoring something we're really seeing from EPCs and, and, and the big scale um, shippers of big scale cargoes? Uh, is that realistic to have nearshoring of these products that are very specialised and can only be built in certain places? Are we really going to reduce that? Perhaps I'll come to you, Ben. I haven't, I haven't I think one of the challenge, I think one of the challenges that the EPC companies could have in this area for, for the short term is in terms of the skill sets. The skill sets have generally moved from the home, the main countries overseas to, to, to Asia, to Europe. So to bring some of them skill sets back isn't, isn't necessarily something that can be done overnight. For sure it can be done, but I think that's got to be part of a much longer term um, plan for, the, for, for those specific companies than just switching, you know, widgets back from A to B. I think it's, yeah, a little bit more challenging than that for these guys. Oscar, does nearshoring play a part in the cargoes that you carry? I, I mean, our, our vessels are traded mainly in the, in the trade loops, but depending on, on car volumes and, and production. And we have actually seen a, a huge change in production or a very agile market and, and quick production changes for the car industry the last decade or, or even more. Uh, and I, I think we are we are used to these changes and we have a very agile uh, trading pattern and, and, and change it uh, as deemed necessary. Actually, you touched there on agility um, and, and that's something that I think has been pretty important in the market as it stands with uh, with the imbalance in supply and demand that we, we currently have. And I think flexibility, agility are, are the two sort of buzzwords. Sarah, do you have any thoughts on that at the moment, how we meet that um, th that imbalance? Uh, 
Mm. I mean, for us as a, as a container carrier, that right, also um, covering special cargo, obviously it's all about the equipment and making sure that the right amount of equipment is available in the places where it needs to be available. So we are now, I mean, we're a tiny bit stronger on the European side. So of course, not bringing equipment back from, from the US or also from Asia down to Europe. That's uh, at times, of course, very much of a challenge if you can't quite fill it. But, but it just means that a lot of different stakeholders that you have within the organization, you just need to make sure that, that you're very nimble and that you get everybody together and that you very quickly actually find solutions while not compromising, of course, on, on commercial success somewhere because you might have to move some empties or you, you try to convert some cargo. So that's also very much something that we're trying to push um, that we, as an example, you can also some dry cargo can, as an example, also be loaded in some open top cargo. And then you can also create some win-win, uh, sorry, open top containers. So you can create some, some win-win situations also with customers, uh, right? If if there are some commodities that can be moved, so so we run really quickly, try to yeah get everybody together and try and find solutions with possible customers and and making sure that we move the equipment from A to B to the right place as fast as possible. And and of course, as a container uh, operator, you have that flexibility of being able to to switch. But Laurent's perhaps more on the on the tramping side. It's a it's a bit more tricky. You know, you've got to find a backhaul, haven't you? Yeah, but at the moment it it is it is quite okay. Normally, the Far East was, of course, the production uh, facility of the world, and therefore you went to all uh, sort of places. Uh, but now also you see uh, European cargoes uh, going to the Far East, so we are quite comfortable uh, with the balance at the moment. Great, uh, Ben. Did you have any thoughts on this? Yeah, I think from an MSC perspective, to be honest with you, we have a certain advantage in terms of scale with the number of ships that are, are in our fleet at the moment, approximately 570 vessels. Um, since the start of the pandemic, in reality, we've tried very much to adjust the uh, the size of the fleet on the individual trade routes to match where possible the, the, the demand from the clients. Um, we've started numerous new services, approximately eight since the, um, since the start of the COVID pandemic. Um, where we've tried to where, where we've tried to take specific actions is to reduce some of the port rotations on the scheduling, especially on the Trans-Pacific routes, to try and minimise some of the port congestions. But the reality of it is, to be honest, the um, the lack of predictability of what can happen in some ports on some voyages is is, is proven a huge challenge. I think for all carriers at the moment, um, it's very very difficult to keep the berthing windows. But hopefully with some of the steps that we've taken, you know, we managed to maintain the services and deliver some new options to our clients. And, and Oscar, from the other perspective, that supply in, uh, imbalance, is that affecting you guys? I think, uh, yeah, of course, it, it's of course very important for us. I think we have been uh, positioned to be very balanced in, in our network in and out, but we are experiencing the same challenges as, as the container industry, where we now see an imbalance on, on the cargo carrying equipment or roll trailers, etc. So uh, yeah, there is a shortage also for us, so we, we need to cope uh, with this and, and we positioning empty, empty equipment as well. Okay, I'd like to change tack slightly here, um, it's still related to our, our very our very high freight market. Um, I think the reason we've we've achieved this is because we um, haven't overordered in the past two to three, four years, and so therefore we have a, a fairly balanced fleet, perhaps even a, a lack of ships, um, and not enough replacement coming through. So I'm I'm curious as to whether any of you guys are considering ordering new ships now. Obviously, you know, freight mates are high, everyone wants to capitalise on it. Um, and if you are, how on earth you are financing it? Because that's a problem at, at the moment, isn't it? Trying to secure financing. Um, Laurence, perhaps you've got a view on that? Yeah, I, uh, I think at the moment uh, every carrier is trying to get uh, some fat on the bones again. Uh, and if you are now uh, considering new builds and before you get them, then you're probably one and a half, two years out. Uh, so to capitalize on the current, uh, you're probably already too late. Um, but in, in the slow periods, normally tonnage is, is ordered because then the, the, the new build rates are most attractive. Um, but also there you see that, uh, that the yards are filling up uh, uh, rapidly. Um, financing, mm, I would not like to touch that subject at the moment. I think uh, there's a lot of uh, yeah, parties that, that previously invested quite easily um, yeah, that are really uh, scratching their heads twice uh, to go into that venture uh, because for the last decade uh, it turned not the best investment. 
Um, but on the other side, uh, tonnage renewal is is due to be uh, to be conducted. Um, so yeah, uh, there will be new builds. Uh, I just hope that it will be more controlled as it was in the last or at least 10 years ago, because then we're talking about uh, the same situations again in a couple of years' time. So We, we have very short memories, though. It's been proven over, over many cycles. Yes. <laughs> so we will see with that. Um, but Sarah, uh, what about on your side from Clapag Lloyd? I mean, obviously, you've got uh, replacement of fleet necessary on such a big fleet. Um, but where, are you, where do you sit with new builds when you're thinking about catering to the um, out-of-gauge sector? Yeah, so obviously, I mean, we have we have placed an order for additional ships, but uh, but I mean, as Lawrence also said, that's down the line, right? So that's not really impacting or or solving anyone's problem right now. So uh, what we are very much focusing on is making sure that we're investing into new equipment, and we actually have, as we speak right now, so new special equipment coming out of China release. So this is very much where we're trying to to support our customers is by making sure that we're investing into equipment right now. So we have uh, some new open tops coming out and some flat racks as well, um, and also some of our hard tops. So that's uh, that's very much what we're trying to, yeah, to support our customers and making sure that the equipment is going to be available. Okay. Ben, are you ordering? Yeah, no, Carly, just on that point, I'd like to add, you know, from an MSC perspective, you know, before the end of the year, there'll be another five Golson class vessels, almost 24,000 TEU, each of them um, be, being launched before the end of the year, which is obviously very exciting. Um, each of those vessels and all the ships in our fleet remain open for break bulk and out of gauge cargo. You know, we have our team around the world. So I'd like to, you know, just to reassure Laurens and everybody that's on the call and watching that we're fully open for it. We're not kicking out the break bulk and out of gauge cargo for containers and our weekly services remain very much open for them. So, uh, Laurence, you uh, you have ordered new ships, and Sari ordered new ships. Ben, you ordered new ships. Oscar, yep. can you complete this? Yeah, we, we have not ordered new ships. Not ordered no. new ships. Sorry, yeah. Laurence, no new ships there. But Oscar, can you um, fill a trio of new ships? Yeah, we, we just recently announced uh, our future new building uh, plans as well. Uh, zero carbon ready vessels and and. Uh, uh, 9,100 car equivalent units, so, so it will be the biggest uh, car carrier in, in the world. And of course, building on the design we have with, with strong ramp capacity uh, and big door opening uh, catered for, for lots of brake bulk uh, cargo. I'm glad you mentioned zero carbon there. So obviously the big a big topic at the moment is fuel and that's one of the problems for new build ordering is that people don't know what fuel to choose uh, or even if it's a, a propulsion solution and um, how are you meeting zero carbon oscar we, we haven't started uh, this year already we we have uh, done uh, some biofuel trials uh, offering them uh, also carbon neutral voyages and and for the future new build program we we, we it is, as you say, uh, it's a lot of things happening on the technological side today. Uh, and what we decided was to go for a flexible design with a multi-fuel engine. Uh, so it can run on biofuel or conventional fuels, including LNG. And then with minor modifications, uh, it can transition to uh, use future uh, carbon zero fuels uh, like green ammonia uh, or, or whatever will be available. So you have basically put everything on the table. You, you're hoping to meet any fuel demand that comes from the IMO later down the line. Yes. Um, what about uh, the new bills that you've ordered, Sarah, with uh, Hapagroid? Um, I'm not, honestly, I'm not 100% sure about the new bills, but we have some from the, so some of the vessels that we um, had from UAIC, they were LNG ready back then. And we have one of the vessels which is currently refitted um, for LNG. I know there's also a lot of discussions and controversy around LNG as a, as a fuel source, but uh, but this is something that we are looking at right now. And, uh, and I think also what we will pursue in the long run. But obviously, at the end of the day, we're open to, you know, to explore any of the additional um, opportunities or options as well for, for alternate uh, fuel sources. And Ben, have you been looking at dual fuel as well? Is that where you've the route that you've gone down? Yeah, I think I think to be honest, the conversation reflects very much where the industry is. I don't think there's any one particular fuel source at the moment that is the the the, the golden bullet that's going to solve the entire problem. 
you know, we know that the Gulfs in class vessels which are being launched and have been launched you know, are amongst the most, if not the most environmentally friendly per tonne of cargo around the world. You know, MSC from a perspective, you know, is trialing quite heavily the biofuels. We used 850,000 tonnes of biofuel last year out of Rotterdam alone, which is quite which is quite an achievement. But I think the reality and the biggest challenge is scaling this up to the right source and the availability around the world. You know, we work with numerous partners to try and deliver this and we will continue to do so. And that sustainability drive, the zero carbon and, and the fuels that we're looking at, that is it's being driven by the public, but it's also being driven by your your customers and your clients. Presumably they're asking you, tell me, how much carbon is this burning? You know, or if they're not, they should be or they will be very soon. How, how are you responding to that um, increase in, uh, in environmental social governance, ESG, from your clients? Laurent, perhaps you'd like to kick off that one? Yeah, thanks. Um, yeah, obviously that question is is asked more frequently, and especially in the break build market, where a lot of the uh, the the industry developments is is uh, fueled by the the oil majors. Uh, they are very conscious about it. They they are basically going through a transition of being a fuel supplier to a to an energy supplier. Uh, they really want to be associated with uh, with with the yeah the the green part of the industry, so to say. Um, it is difficult uh, to always quantify. What we do uh, as just the Jumbo SEL Alliance, we like to present the customer a optimized logistical uh, package uh, where you can say, hey, we can combine uh, certain load ports uh, in one shipment uh, or where the client thinks of uh, 24 shipments, uh, we can reduce it to 20 uh, because we use uh, bigger intake or whatever. And therewith, we can yeah, we can reduce the, uh, the, the bunker footprint, so to say. We've also looked at uh, the biofuel. Uh, the, the problem there is the availability in Rotterdam is perfect, uh, but in the rest of the world, uh, not, not yet uh, that frequently available. But the results of the tests we did, very positive. Um, we also investigated uh, LNG. Yeah, LNG on a breakbulk vessel is uh, is a bit challenging. Uh, normally they are smaller of size, and the LNG tanks are quite uh, quite quite large, um, and it's rather impossible to get a hot work permit uh, in order to uh, to to less and secure your cargo. Uh, but definitely looking at uh, at what's out there because as uh, as everybody is saying, the industry is demanding it. Yeah, uh, are you finding that as well, Sarah? That your customers are demanding it more. Yeah, I think so customers, but already for quite a number of years, I think the trend is just increasing that it's more and more customers, especially the big guys, right, that actually tie it into their the annual tender negotiations, as an example. But I don't think it's it's by now still also a qualifier. It's not necessarily a differentiator. Um, so I think it is it's just, you know, something as a carrier, you need to be mindful about it. You need to strive to do the best that is possible within within basically our industry. And uh, which is also clearly our ambition that we want to do as HAPAC Lloyd as well. Um, but as I said, so I think it is continue, continuing to be an increasing trend, um, but uh, but it's not it's not a differentiator anymore. It's just something that you have to do at the end of the day. Do you agree with that, Oscar? It's not yeah. a differentiator anymore. Uh -huh. Fully full, full agree. And it's just escalating. It's going, the, the change is going quicker and quicker. We, we see more and more customers, not only just asking questions, they are implementing the demands or requirements in, into contracts as well. So, so it's, um, it's definitely here. Yeah. But I, think, I think also as an industry, we're driving the change as well. I don't think it's just because companies and, and, our, and our valuable customers are coming to us asking for us, but I think all major corporations and companies, in fact, whether they're small or large, have to have an environmental awareness and an environmental policy nowadays. I think the average age of container vessels, especially the MSC ones, lead to a certain um, environmental advantage. Um, but the reality of it is I think every company has, whether they're running tr trucks, trains or vessels, have a responsibility to minimise the impact on the environment. Yeah, and um, beyond that, obviously that is incredibly important. But but also, um, you you won't get finance for anything. You know, if you're a legitimate big company and you can't prove your your green credentials now and prove them properly, not just a carbon calculator that someone knocked up uh, very easily, you know, on a, on a website. It's not it's not enough. You've got to do it and do it properly. 
No, I think that's a, that's a valid point as well, eh? because if you look at the uh, the trans uh, the transfers to using scrubbers in in our industry, it's not so highly adapted as as one would expect. And then, of course, also the legislation. Eh? Then you have the, uh, the 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 open loop uh, scrubber systems where you basically eject uh, in the in in the ocean. Yeah, in a lot of areas, not even allowed anymore. So it's it it becomes also uh, difficult. And I wonder if people that highly invested in uh, in the scrubber technology, uh, if they are very happy with the decision they've uh, they've taken, because it's a huge investment, and it's not necessarily being paid back yet. And, and you make a very interesting point because it's about that first mover, the dangers of being the first mover. And actually that brings me on to my, my last question about innovation. Um, and, and perhaps it's a bit of a loaded question when we just mentioned that the first mover advantage is not always as great as it seems. Um, but are, are there any innovations that you're, you're working on or you're working with at the moment or anything you've got planned um, that would be uh, of interest to our audience, uh, uh, the brake bolt industry, things that are really out there um, that you've been working on or working with. Sarah, perhaps I could come to you. Yeah, I mean, it's not, it's not I mean, it's definitely not rocket science and, uh, and I guess not innovation as such, but, but what we are trying to do is basically to, to just become more, I would say, systematized and automated when it comes to, to costing and, and rating basically for, for pre lash cargo and also for brake bolt cargo, just simply make it faster, right? Because I think we all, um, you know, preparing a break by quote today takes a lot of time because you have to go, you know, gets all the, the bits and balls from all these different places and so on. And, uh, and sometimes, you know, decisions just need to be taken faster. And uh, and that's what we are right now trying to work on. So to have more of a, a web platform where you can get rates um, for pre lash and also for break bulk and then basically just make sure that we cater to our customers faster with, with rate offers, um, because I think that's where, I mean, for sure, but then Havoc Law, but I would say in the industry as a whole, everything is still handled very manually because it is just, you know, not not as, you know, square as as the rest of at least, you know, our cargo. But uh, but we still kind of try to make it as as square as possible as it still makes sense, because obviously you also can't put everything in a box when it comes to break box. So um, so at least uh, so that's what we're kind of trying to drive towards um, for our customers and of course also driving internally also efficient system by by having that. I think it's still an important innovation. It may not be classed as innovation for everybody, but obviously something that makes the whole process more streamlined and efficient for a customer. Well, I think we can still class it as that. Okay. Oscar, <laughs> Oscar, how about you? Any innovation that you uh, can think of? Yeah, I mean, I mean, it goes a little bit in the, in the same direction. Uh, cargo change, and, and we also need to change the vessels. Uh, I did mention our new building program, but we also changed the structural design, the, the ramps, the, the to actually take more cargo, the heavier cargo, or, uh, wider or higher cargo. So, so of course, vessel design need to be changed, and and also uh, digital solutions, uh, of course, uh, need to develop uh, for the future cargo as well. Laurence, I, I know that Jumbo. Um, I've, I did an article recently on uh, the AR technology that you're using to do deck marking, um, which yep. I found fascinating. Quick plug for Break Bulk magazine there, please go and read it on that <laughs> site. <laughs> but obviously I count that as very innovative on, on a real sort of uh, technical level. Is there anything yeah. else that you guys are working on or working with? No, no. Uh, basically, that is the the latest and the greatest, and uh, I must admit it's 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 a great achievement because it uh, it basically it does all the engineering you do in the office, and you project it uh, via Hololens uh, to the people uh, actually doing the deck marking, and yeah, talk about efficiency, uh, lesser mistakes, and and faster. Yeah, then uh, that's it. You you can easily save a day in port if you do the preparation via the Hololens. And we're rolling it out as uh, as we speak. And saving a day in port is obviously uh, money, money well well saved. Yes. Yeah. Uh, ben, how about you to to wrap this up? I think I think we've talked a lot about innovation in reality just in this this conversation. You know, whether we're talking innovation on the ships for the technology, whether we're talking about innovation in services and changing routes to our speed up transit times, or at least minimise delays onto our clients. You know, from an MSC perspective, we know these new Golson class vessels are are for for the traditional fuel and and fitted for the LNG. Um, and and I just think 
continuous steps and progress in innovation will be the will be the way you know e even things like msc's you know now, now automated hull cleaning we, we we're using more and more shore power for the vessels alongside which all the time minimizes the environmental impact um so if we can keep going down this road and innovate more our services to provide more solutions then better for everybody to be honest Great, and I think that was a nice blend there of um, operational, technical, practical, administrative innovation, and it takes many forms. Um, I'd like to thank you all for your your input. That was that was a great conversation, and and really interested to hear um, what you're all doing in this carrier check-in. So thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you very much.